You may be seated. Before I come and speak today, I want us to be greeted by one of the elders. Amen. We, we have, we've have missed him since he's been working in Arizona, but he came back and he's visiting. So I want him to share a little bit of what's going on there in Arizona. God bless you, Brother Canales. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. I'm just going to say some things. I have something on my heart, though. I got I to gotta get out. My father taught me that nothing's free. If it's worth getting, it's worth paying for. And I've watched over the last several years as the devil has tried to quiet Pentecost, trying to shut our mouth and keep us down. I literally watched this week as I was in a powerful conference and I would start working the aisle, the altar area from this side across. And the last two nights I watched as I began to pray with young people and their mouths are moving, their tongue is moving. And from a distance, it looked like they were speaking in tongues. But when you got up close to them, there was no sound coming out of their mouth. Nothing. In fact, we prayed with one, one young lady till, till we were all just exhausted, just trying to get her to speak out. I literally stopped her and asked her to ask Jesus to help her, just to say that. And she'd start and couldn't continue. And I remember on Thursday night, I worked my way across and I noticed this. And I get over to this side of the church where the deaf ministry is at. And they're praying with someone to receive the Holy Ghost. And I watched as, as the Holy Ghost came on them and they began to speak in tongues. And you could hear what they were saying. It was audible. It was loud. Amen. And I remember then again on Friday night, the exact same thing happens. And there was this oriental lady that I, I just thought she was oriental. I didn't realize that she didn't speak at all. I thought she just didn't speak English. I had no idea what was going on until I realized. And I laid my hand on her head. And as I laid my hand on her head, she began to scream and speak in other tongues as the, as the Spirit of the Lord gave her liberty. And I come back through and I tried to encourage young people to speak out. Even the music that has come into the church has become flatlined. Where there's no highs and there's no lows. It's just... Mm, there's no lifting of the voice. There's no expression of the voice. People say, well, it doesn't take all that. Well, on the day of Pentecost, amen, there was noised abroad. There was a rushing mighty wind. Hallelujah. It was sound. Amen. And in a birthing room, amen, it's never quiet. There's calling out. Even with all the organization and even with the skill of the doctor and the nurses and all the practice things that they do, it's still loud. Amen. It's still, it's still a sound. Amen. A birthing. And a battle and in a war it's not quiet they don't fight just a quiet fight but it's loud and while Pentecost is trying to have revival while Pentecost is trying to move forward amen and we're trying to quiet it down they're even bringing a stool out so you don't have to move no more and you lead worship from a stool and everything's just gone flatlined. I'm telling you, Life Tabernacle, it's time, amen. It's time for you to lift your voice. It's time to not be shut down. It's time to be loud in the Holy Ghost. It's time, amen, to be loud and take it to the streets. It's time to be loud and be noticed. Hallelujah. How did the revival happen? They heard them. They heard them. It was noise abroad. Everywhere that they went, there was an uproar. Everywhere that they went, everywhere you see, amen, people receiving the Holy Ghost. Amen. It was loud. And I'm not saying that Life Tabernacle's doing it wrong. I'm telling you, you're doing it right. But don't allow, don't allow the things and the voices that are being spoken because I know they are. I've dealt with it time and time again. It doesn't take all that. You can do it quietly. What about the still small voice? That was spoken to an individual. That was a one-on-one -on -one deal where God said, I want you to quiet yourself and listen to me because you got too many things going on in your mind. You've got all this stuff going on. You're worried about what all the things that are happening. I want you to just shut up and listen. That's different than worship and praise. That's different than an apostolic move of God. Right, right. 
when we come together it needs to be loud and it needs to be demonstrative and it needs to be expressive hallelujah the world is getting louder and louder and the church is getting quieter and quieter amen it's time amen for us to rise up as apostolic pentecostal and say hey hey you say well what does that got to do with where you're at the minute I got there, I started the job. I left here, amen, on a, on a Monday. Last service was Sunday. Left here on Monday. Started working on Tuesday. And the very first day, there was a devil in my face. Trying to quiet me down. Trying to change who I was. Saying, well, you're the new guy. You shouldn't act like that. You're the new guy. You should keep your mouth shut. You're the new guy. You should. Do. And, and, and all the whole area, I began to feel the spirits of Winslow. Amen. The Mormon spirits and the native spirits begin to move on me. And everywhere I turned, it was like, we got you. And I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Amen. That's why we have service on Tuesday. That's why we have service on Wednesday. That's why we have prayer on Thursday. That's why we have pray service on Sunday morning in Flagstaff and Sunday night in Winslow. That's why we're going to Holbrook because we're not going to be quiet. We're not going to stop that. We're going to be louder and louder and louder and louder. Amen. And I feel my, in my spirit of hallelujah that God has wanted to do some other things that haven't even been mentioned yet. I was leading the worship. I forget what night it was leading the worship. And I, and I felt to say some things. And I stopped and I began to talk. And there's a building that's rotting. I thought it was a Kmart building. They said, well, the Kmart's already been knocked down. So it's another building, big building. And I said, well, what about that? Brother Bolding comes back the next Sunday night, starts talking. And he says, you know what? I feel like God's going to give us that building. Why? Because we're being loud and we're speaking out and the Holy Ghost is saying, don't you, don't you be shut down by all of this. I'm telling you, Life Tabernacle, it's time to get louder than you've ever gotten. Amen. These men that came up here and challenged you, amen, to take your place and to name your place. Hallelujah. You're not going to do it quietly. Say, I'm serving the Lord, but no, you're going to do it demonstratively. You're going to do it with expression. Matt, God called you to this corner, but God called you to worship with everything you have. He told me on the last Sunday, I'm going to steal your moves. I said, take them. It's time. It's time for Life Tabernacle. Those of you that are faithful, those of you that want a revival, to sound out. Sound out. Sound out! Hallelujah. And I'm going to be checking in. I, I, I do it all the time. I'm watching every little thing from afar. And I'm praying about some things. And I'm seeing some things. And I'm saying, okay, God, right there. Right there. You keep moving on that man right there. You keep moving on that man. There, 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 there's a man that gets, on, that gets on the group meet every single week. And he's got something to say, but he hasn't been in church yet. I'm not speaking against him. I'm speaking for him. Because God is pulling on his heart. And God is trying to get his attention. And all he's got to do is shake it off and say, you know what? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Hallelujah. Is there anybody in this house that says, hey, I'm a part of Life Tabernacle. I'm a part of the kingdom of God. And I'm not going to be silent. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to retire. But I'm going to get in it. I'm going to get in it. Somebody sound out. Somebody sound out. Somebody sound out. Hallelujah. 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 What's his name? What's his name? Call his name with a loud voice. Jesus. 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 Jesus! Come on, young people! Come on, young people! You heard the elders talking about it, and I believe it. When young people, when young people begin to lift their voice, when young people begin to say, I don't care where mom and daddy's at, 
I don't care what else is going on. I want God and I want revival with everything in my heart and everything in my life. Amen. It's worth, it's worth the price. It's worth the price. It's not going to come free or cheap, but it's worth the price. And as you carry, as you carry your relationship with God out loud, that's not going in the restroom and changing your clothes. That's walking out loud. I'm an apostolic Pentecostal. Amen. Hallelujah. That's praying over your food at lunch out loud. You don't have to be, you know, rebuking everybody and doing all that kind of stuff. You just have to live your life out loud. They're doing it to you. They're doing it to you. The homosexuals and, and all of them are, are walking around hand in hand through the campus. And here the, the, the Pentecostals and the apostolics are afraid to even say anything. Come on. Young people, God is for you. And the church is for you. Amen. And you're not going to find anything, anything worth paying for. But revival. Hallelujah. We want revival. We want, you know, it's, thank you, Brother Canales, for that. Amen. Because we, and this is what we're going to talk about today. This is pretty amazing how this all works out. But, you know, this is the thing is, is that we are, we are people that have been changed by the power of Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. It, it, some of y'all know each other's testimonies. Some of you don't. And, and, and when you look at someone and you look at their praise and their worship and their response and their lifestyle, you might scratch your head thinking, why do they do that? But you don't know their history. You don't know what God's done for them. You don't know how God has brought them out. And, and, and sometimes when we fail to understand the purpose behind their praise, we despise their praise. Oh, and when we despise their praise, it leaves us in a place of barrenness. And that's what I want to talk to us today. If you have your Bibles with you, let, let's stand to our feet. Don't leave the organ. I might try to do a little bit of that right there. Because it, Amen. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 23, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. All right. Genesis 1, 27, 28, and then 2 Samuel 6, 23. Genesis 1, 27, 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created, the, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Everybody say, be fruitful and multiply. That is the commandment of God for his people. God designed us to be fruitful and to multiply. Second Samuel 6.23 says, Therefore, Michal, or Michael, however you prefer to say it, the daughter of Saul had no children to the day of her death. Therefore, Michal or Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. You can grab your neighbor's hand if it's appropriate, and we're going to pray together today. Lord, we come to you today. We ask you, God, to speak to our hearts, anoint our ears to hear, our minds to understand, our hearts to hide your word, and our bodies to live out the faith, God that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray your favor, your blessing upon your people today. Anoint your servant to speak with us, says the Lord. Let me be encouraging. Let me, let me, let me see, God, your word produce fruit, God. I want to see, God, your will be done today in your church and among your people in the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, amen. Can we clap our hands to the Lord today? Amen, amen. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell him, be fruitful and multiply. You may be seated. Amen. To all our first time guests, our friends, we want to say thank you for being here today. I am so blessed that you're here and this service would not be the same if you weren't. Man, so we actually, let's give all our guests a round of applause. 
Amen. Amen. We're, we're just so happy that you're here today. Thank you for being here today. I, I, want, I would say that from the bottom of my heart. Also, one more announcement that we forgot to announce. Next Sunday is our three-year anniversary. Amen. So we want to encourage you to come be a part of what God is doing. Pastor Sam Emery will be here, which I'm excited about that because the first time I ever came to this church as a messed up kid was my brother, my older brother inviting me here to hear Pastor Sam Emery. So for me, it's, it's just a double blessing. Amen. But so bring somebody with you. We will be having food afterwards. And so we just want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Here we read the commandment from God. The first thing that he told man and woman was to be fruitful and multiply. That is the will of God for his creation, for us to be fruitful and multiply. In the Jewish or ancient Israel, matrimony or a marriage was important. It was part of something that people looked forward to. Both men and women, uh, for them, marriage was normal. Marriage was something that was eventually going to happen. But the marriage, the, the coming together of a man and a, wife and a woman becoming one flesh was for the sole purpose of reproduction or procreation. It was for them to fulfill the first commandment that came out of Genesis 1, 27, 28. When God seen man and woman, woman and told them to be fruitful and multiply. That was God's purpose for marriage. Marriage produces love. Marriage produces friendship. Marriage produces a lot of things. But the purpose for marriage and God's original plan was for procreation. God desired for men and a woman to get together to procreate. That is why you cannot have two of the same sexes come together and be married because they cannot fulfill the plan and the purpose of God. Amen. God's purpose for marriage, everybody say God's purpose for marriage is for procreation. Amen. So in other words, if you can't procreate, then you can't get married. Amen. That's just the word of God. All right. So we'll, we'll put that on, 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 the, on, on YouTube or something. Amen. But that, that is the purpose for marriage. That is the purpose why God created man and woman, uh, female and male, because they were to come together, become one flesh and procreate. That was what God desired for man and woman. But in the Bible, we read about six different women that were married and found themselves to be barren. It wasn't any of their, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't because they did something wrong that they were barren. It was just that they were. It was just the case. That was the, the that was what had fallen upon them. And again, if you are barren today, I, I, I pray that, that God opens your womb if you're praying for a child and that God blesses you with the child. But uh, today I want to talk to us about six people that were barren and God truly turned things around. We, we read about Sarah who was the wife of Abraham, who was unable to have child. She was older already, and she couldn't give birth to a son or a daughter. She couldn't give birth at all. She couldn't conceive. And, and finally, God came to Abraham and told him that them too would have a baby, and that he would be a baby of promise, and that that seed would be blessed, and that seed would be a blessing to all the nations. And God fulfilled his promise to Abraham and Sarah. Another woman was Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. Isaac. She wanted a baby. She cried to the point of saying, give me a baby or give me death. And then there was uh, Rachel, the wife of Jacob, who also wanted to conceive and have a baby. But for whatever reason, she was unable to. So, so, she, so she allowed, uh, 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 but, but he was able to have babies with, with his other wife. And we don't believe in polygamy. And that wasn't the will of God. All right. So, uh, but, but, but ultimately, God heard her prayer and God gave Rachel a baby. There was the unnamed wife of Manoah. Manoah was eventually, or the father of Samson. Amen. And, and she was barren. She could not give birth to a child, yet God saw something in her to the point where he blessed her with a son that was going to be a savior of their people. Then there was Hannah. And Hannah is probably one of my most favorite woman characters of the Bible. This woman who was married to Elkanah. She did desire to produce a baby for her husband. She loved him with all her heart. And they would go to the 
temple year after year to offer offering to the, 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 the to, to God at the, at the tabernacle. And, and as, as they would go there, uh, she would cry because Elkanah at the time was married to another woman named Panina who was able to bear fruit or produce or give children to Elkanah. And so it would hurt uh, uh, Hannah to know that, that, that Elkanah and his family were going to offer sacrifices at the temple and she could not do it with, with her family because she couldn't have one because she was barren. But God heard her prayer. God heard her petition and God opened her wound and God blessed her with a young baby boy named Samuel who became the prophet of God who anointed the first and the second king of Israel to do a great and mighty work for the kingdom of God. Amen. And that, that, that is my favorite, probably my favorite lady when it comes to, to, to just women in the Bible. But as we look, we look at these stories, we look at these people in the Bible that were barren. It wasn't because they wanted to be. It wasn't because they were, they, 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 it wasn't of their choice. It wasn't because they committed a sin, but it was because it just happened to be that they were barren women. But God saw it fit to give them a child, a baby, so they became fruitful and they multiplied. But barrenness in the ancient world was something to be ashamed of. Barrenness in the ancient world meant that your husband can marry somebody else until they could produce a family for your husband so that the family name could go forward. Barrenness was something that would bring shame to a woman and a woman would be in depression and in agony and in shame because of her barrenness. God's will was not for them to be barren. God ultimately wanted them to be fruitful and multiply. That's what he said in Genesis 1, 27, 28. But for whatever reason, some of these women, that was the case and they, were, they found themselves barren. And I said all of that to, to bring us back to a story, a story in the Bible where there was a man by the name of David. David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man that was anointed king over Israel. He was a man that God had chosen to rule over his people. The Bible calls him the prince of the people. And so as, as David becomes king, David then knows that he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the box, the sacred box, that the, the place where the presence of God would sit in between the cherubims and the glory of God would fill that place and the presence of God would do a great and mighty work. So David recognized that it was time to bring this box, the Ark of the Covenant, back into his place, back into a place where he could be in the midst of the people of God. And so David, the Bible says, he went to the house of Obed-Edom in the city of David with gladness. And, and, and it was so, the Bible tells us, those bearing the ark that the Lord had gone six, pace, gone six paces and that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. In other words, as they're bringing the ark of the covenant back into the city of David, David is coming and offering sacrifices every six steps. He's giving God praise for the fact that he's able to bring the glory of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the Ark of the Covenant back into the house of David. And as he's doing that, the Bible says that David danced before the Lord with all his might. And he was wearing a linen infant so that David and all of the house brought up the Ark of the Lord shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. In other words, David excited about the fact that the presence of God was coming back into the people of God. He was shouting. He was dancing. He was down the trumpet they were offering sacrifice they were making a loud noise unto God but the Bible says in chapter 6 verse 16 of 2nd Samuel that now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David Machiel Saul's daughter looked through the window and saw David leaping and whirling before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. She despised him. She looked through the window and she saw David offering sacrifices every six steps. She saw David dancing and shouting. She saw David spitting around, twirling around, making a fool of himself. She thought that she despised the man that she was married to. 
She thought this guy is a fool. This guy is lame. This guy is dumb. This guy is an embarrassment to me. Why is he doing that? He's the king of Israel. Doesn't he know who he is? He's dignitary. He's royalty. He's someone of position. Who does he think he is and buried him, embarrassing himself in front of the people that are around? He needs to be walking with pride. He needs to be walking with his head up in the air. He needs to be walking all dignified and put together. He needs to actually be carried by somebody else because he's the king. And so she looked at David as he was coming into the city, as he was coming in in front of the ark. He was dancing and trolling and singing and shouting and giving God praise because the glory of God was coming into the people in the midst of the people of Israel. So she despised them. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had placed. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both women, men, and everyone a loaf of bread and a piece of meat. Man, when God begins to move on a person that's a worshiper, that worshiper begins to bless other people. And a cake of raisins so that the people departed everyone to his house. Check this out, verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. He went back to bless his wife. He went back to bless his home. He went back to bless what was there. And Machiel, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. Look what she says. How glorious was the king of Israel today. Now you might think, oh, that's awesome. She's, she's, she's the man, you're just so great. You did so awesome. The way you were dancing, those moves were like Brother Canales. But this is what she tells him. She, 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 instead of being complimentary, she was, she was being mean. She was being horrible. She was, she, was, she was saying, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one, as base fellow, shamelessly uncovering himself. In other words, you were, you were just letting, you were being transparent in the midst of the presence of God. You embarrassed yourself, and you embarrassed me. Your praise, what you were doing just made you look like a total fool. So David said to Mikhail, it was before the Lord. It was before the Lord. Can I tell someone today that when we get up here and we do shout and we do dance and we do speak in tongues and we do pray and we get crazy, it's not because we're doing it for you or for anybody else. When we come up here and we dance and we, dance, we scrow, shout and we scream and we talk in tongues and we pray out loud, it's because we're here before the Lord and we come to give Him praise, honor and glory. We come because we're excited about what God has done for us. We come because the presence of God is in this place. That's it. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. But I do this because the Lord is in this place. It was the Lord before, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father. See, she had forgotten that her daddy was the king before David. She had forgotten that her daddy despised the voice and the word of God. And because he committed a sin before the Lord and decided to put matters into his own hands, instead of waiting for the prophet of God to move forward, he lost the kingdom of God. He lost the kingdom of Israel and God replaced him with David. David is telling her, uh, his wife, the daughter of the first king, don't you, don't you, don't you forget what God has done for me. You might think it looks foolish you might think it looks stupid you might think it looks like I'm just an ignorant uh, Israelite that's, that's what he was an Israelite you might just think I'm just foolish looking but the truth is is that God took your dad's position and he gave it to me I wasn't anybody I was just a shepherd boy I was in the middle of nowhere doing nothing but God anointed me with the spirit God called me out of darkness God saved my life from sin and I'm here today. I gotta give him praise. I gotta give him glory. I gotta give him worship because he is worthy. I don't know about you.
about you today, but I get excited because I don't belong here. I should be in the streets. I should be in prison. I should be out there, but by the grace of God, I will shout. I will dance. I will give praise because I'm not where I was. She had forgotten what God had done for her husband. Wives, don't forget what God has done for your husband. We're real quick now that God puts everything together to be dignified. We're real quick to forget about the praise and the worship that we used to give when we were all broke and messed up and had nothing going for us. But then God begins to bless our finances. God gives us better cars. God gives us better jobs. God cleans us up. God, God does great things in our lives. God elevates us in position and we begin to forget who we were. We forget to forget. We begin to forget the praise that we used to give and our wives are trying to shut us down. Quit shouting. Quit praising. You're dignified you're someone with position you got education I rebuke that spirit right now in the name of Jesus I might be smarter I might dress better I might have more money but praise God I'm still that kid on the streets I'm still that person that knows where I came from I know I don't belong here but by the mercy and the grace of God I am what I am I will praise him I will worship I will bless him I will exalt him Where are you today? You've forgotten where you come from. You've forgotten how to praise. You've forgotten how to worship. You've forgotten how to lift up your voice. I want to challenge you today. Lift up your voice. Lift up your shout. Lift up your dance. Lift up your praise. In the name of where are you David where are you David where are you David where are you David yes a simple level of oil by the mercy of God you are who you are David remembered what God had done for him because David remembered he didn't let his position stop him from giving God praise when the presence entered the city. David would act a fool because it didn't matter what anybody else thought. It didn't matter what his woman thought. It didn't matter what anyone else thought. All he knew was the presence of the Lord is in this place. I am privileged to be here, therefore, I will praise him. Well, I want to challenge you today. If God has been good to you, if God has set you free, if God has delivered you, if God has done a work in your life, these altars are open. I want you to give God.